morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody down in Mullaloo. Let's give them a big clap. Everybody watching online, welcome. It is so good to just be together. If we haven't met, my name's Dean, part of the team here at True North, and great to have you here today. We are in a series right now that we're going to be diving into. It's all about how we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We'll get into that in just a minute. But I want you just to take a moment, turn to whoever is next to you, and just say, how you going? How you going? All right? <laughs> Ask him how you going. You take a minute. You know, you give an answer. Take a minute. It's fine. We got time. You know, it's, it, it, we often, when I first moved to Australia, I remember it was different to say, how are you going? And in the U.S. where I grew up, usually you say, uh, we usually say, how are you doing? You know, whereas here it's often, you know, how are you going? And so I don't know if anybody shared how they got where you are today or not, but it's what we ask. We ask, how are you going? Uh, now, turn to a person on a different side of you, and I want you to ask a slightly different question and give a response. I want you to say to them, hey, how's your soul today? How's your soul today? Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you could hear the groan in this room or what it was like where you are. Whoa. Do you know? You know, these uh, two only slightly different questions, and yet uh, for most of us, we probably find it a little bit easier to answer the question, how are you going or how are you doing and uh, how was your week? Uh, you ask somebody, how was your week? What will you most likely hear? What do you reckon be the most likely answer? We surveyed 100 people. Most likely answer was? Busy. You hear all the time, how was your week? I'm busy. And like, what does busy even mean? I don't know. I didn't have time to think about how my week was. But we know intrinsically as well, there's a little bit of a difference between how are you, how are you going, how are you doing? But once we ask that question, hey, how's your soul? We sort of know, wait a second, we just went somewhere else. How's your soul feels like you're asking me something that's a little bit different than just how am I doing or how am I going? The soul is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we are here, we're in a series, if you're new with us, called uh, Heart, Soul, Mind, and Strength. It's all about this idea that Jesus said, here's how we could all know the life we were created for, uh, God intended for us, this Zoe, this Zoe Ionios life. And that He says we find it when we learn to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. That that is the pathway. But one of the things we often find hard is to even ask the question of what's going on in my soul. It's somehow a little bit elusive to think about or to almost kind of uh, put language around. And yet, so we have to ask the question, what does it look like to love God with all our soul? That's what we're going to look at today. So here's my hope today is that you will spend a little bit of time thinking about something you may not often, and that's reflecting a little bit more on what, uh, on how is your soul, and what might it look like to love God with all your soul. You know, there's a famous story about a, a comedian named Ray Romano. How many people know Ray Romano? Uh, you know, he was just a, another struggling comic in New York City for a long time. I think well into his 20s, if I'm not mistaken, he was still just living at his parents' house, uh, doing stand-up, waiting for that big break. And, uh, and then he gets this big break. There were shows like Seinfeld on where stand-up comics, and so a network was like, we're going to take a chance on this comic. Why don't you come out to California? Uh, and this was his big break. And he went out to California and he became, uh, his show, Everybody Loves Raymond, uh, became one of the most popular uh, sitcoms on television. In fact, by the end of the show, he was the highest paid actor on a sitcom in U.S. history at the end of it. And he kind of uh, got to the end of it. They finished the taping of the last, sh the last show. And he stood before the audience. Some of you may have heard this story. He stood before the audience and he said these words to them. He said, when I moved out here, he said, my brother actually put a note in my suitcase right before I, I left for California from New York. And he said, uh, I didn't read it. He said his brother gave him a hug. He said goodbye. He went out, didn't read the note. But he got to California, and he opened up the note, and he read it. And it said this, what good does it do a person to gain the whole world but lose your soul? And Ray said in those moments, 
Because people wondered, why are you calling the quits? Why are you done anyway? But he said in, to the audience that was there with him that day, he said, I've come out here. It's been extraordinary. I feel like I've gained the whole world. But it's time for me, he said, to work on my soul. And in that story, there is something of us that I think for all of us probably goes, what does it actually mean, though? Like, what, so what's Ray been doing? That was like 15 years ago. I'm not, I want to talk to Ray. <laughs> what have you been doing? What's that looked like since then? What does it mean to, to work on our soul? And so, uh, you know, Jesus teaches so often about the soul. So often uh, we can almost mistake so much of what Jesus wants to do and not realize that uh, one of his primary concerns for you and I is that we have a healthy soul with which we can love God with all our soul. And so we're just going to look today at some passages. Maybe you're new to church or faith or the scriptures. We're going to look at some parts of scripture where Jesus taught about the soul. We're going to look at and reflect a little bit for each one of ourselves. What does it mean to, to make sure that we don't fall into that trap that Jesus, those words of Jesus, that you know what, it's possible to gain everything in life but lose your soul. What does that mean? Well, we're going to start with this parable. Uh, there's a parable Jesus once told uh, about where he spoke a lot about the soul. And it comes to us in Luke chapter 12. And here's a little bit of the background. Luke chapter 12, uh, we're going to pick it up where Jesus has been teaching. There's a crowd of people around him. And then this uh, young man in the crowd yells out a question to him. It says in Luke 12 verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I'm so glad that no one's ever yelled that to me in church. Hey, Dean. Hey, you know, could you just help me out with something? My brother doesn't want to give me what I believe is my fair share. Uh, this is so as a young person probably speaking, my older brother's getting all the inheritance. Can you tell him, Jesus, I think it would be better uh, and perhaps more loving if he would just split that with me or split it a little different. I want more uh, of that inheritance. But Jesus said to him, man, and I love this. I just imagine it, man, you know, like, you know, if this was now, I kind of be like, mate, mate. You know, who, uh, who made me judge or arbiter over you? You want to draw me into this? You think my role is to kind of step in and maybe help you work out something that's a problem in your life? He says, but that's not what I'm here for. And he said to them, so then he turns back to the rest of the crowd. And he goes, take care, watch out. And be on your guard against all covetousness. Be on your guard against that which your heart starts to love and draw towards and incline and think I must have that. Be on guard against that. He says, uh, he says, for one's life, let me hear you say this, for one's life. How many people want to take a guess at what Greek word for life is there? Anybody know? Zoe. zoe. You guys are good Greek students all the way around. I heard you. You know, because your zoe, your zoe, the actual life you're looking for, not just your bios, not just your, you know, do you have enough to get by? No, your zoe. If you want zoe, guess what? It's not found in the abundance of possessions. In other words, all the, this guy in this crowd, and he says to Jesus, teacher or, or rabbi, do you know what's interesting is he's not, that's not how Jesus' actual disciples uh, tend to address him. They usually, his disciples, you'll watch, they'll call him Lord most often. This is someone who doesn't look at Jesus and say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of under your authority or I'm, I'm willing to be your student. He's just saying, hey, teacher, you're a good teacher. Could you help me with the problem I've got? I want to make this better. And Jesus is like, that's not what I'm here to do. Don't, don't drag me into that. And he turns the back to the rest of the crowd and, and says to them, I want you to watch out because do you know what can happen? He says, be on guard against this, on letting it, your heart be coveting to, to pursue and to draw towards just having a lot of possessions. Because Zoe will not be found there. It won't be found there. And then he tells this parable. And I always think, man, all, most of the people who get no name that ask Jesus a question, I think they all are like saying to the neighbor, like, just don't ask him anything next time. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. And anyway, but Jesus says to him, then he says, let me tell you a little story. Let me tell you a little parable. And Jesus tells this parable. He says, the land of a rich man, let me hear you say the land. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. There's a rich man. He's got some land, and his crop is like an abundant one. He wins, at this moment, the land lottery. 
He's already rich, but his land just, boom, bumper crop. And so he thought to himself, self, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. What a problem. I won so much in the lotto, the bank done told me there's not enough room to store it all. Like that's, what am I going to do? This is my problem, my biggest problem in life. How many people like to have this guy's problems? My biggest problem is I have so much money, I run out of, he is Scrooge McDuck, the money bin's too full, he is swimming around, there's, what am I going to do? So he says, I got an idea. This, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, and I will build bigger barns, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, 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 you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, great plan, bruh. <laughs> Love it. Let me help you with that. <laughs> God said to him, fool, oh, mate, you're a fool. This night, your soul, your soul will be required of you. And all these things you've prepared, all these barns you build, all this uh, stuff you've stored up, whose is that going to be? He says, so it is the one who lays up treasure for himself, but is not rich toward God. And this becomes what's known as the parable of the rich fool. Now, the work in Greek, because I heard that you love learning Greek so much, is aphron. Let me hear you say aphron. Now, I tell you that for almost no other reason. I think it's just a cool word to say. And if you find yourself in some discussion this week where it feels appropriate, you may want to say, you aphron. No, just kidding. That's... <laughs> Not helpful or appropriate, probably anywhere, uh, but make sure if you do it, you, it's a Jesus-style version. But do you know what makes him the Afron in this story? What makes him the fool? And why Jesus tells this, this quite striking parable and little story? Because he wants to emphasize this. Over and over, we see these ideas in this little story. We see, one, there's the idea of Zoe. And Jesus is going to go, hey, I want you to understand where Zoe comes from. This is what we're created for. This is what God wants for our lives. And the human heart often thinks it will be found in our possessions or our exterior world. And then he tells this quite, you know, as they often are, very exaggerated type of parable. This very, you know, over the top. There's a guy who's rich and, and he just gets more. And so what the best he can think of to do with it is just keep tearing down barns and store them more and more. Because he thinks then my soul... You know, we'll have, we can relax. We got plenty stored up for many years. You just kind of chill and take it easy, and that'll be a good plan. But then that night, he doesn't realize he actually, he, he, he's forgotten something. He's forgotten that his soul was on loan to him, and it's going to be required. You see, this story, here's what I think is helpful, this story, as we begin it, it, thinking about the soul, is to... Uh, first of all, I'll say this. You want to know the first step to loving God with all your soul is to be uh, attentive, aware, and acknowledging of the fact that you have a soul and it is the most important thing that you have. The soul is so difficult to even speak about. We try to articulate what is the soul. And it's one of those things that's like you can only kind of dance around it and paint pictures and try to figure out. Because the soul, and we're going we're gonna to look at, this is be our working kind of definition for it. The Greek word here is suke. And it's uh, this word that deals with saying kind of the core, the interior of our life. It is almost like the, the very center of who we are. It goes deeper than our thoughts. It goes deeper than our feelings. It is the very essence of who we are. It is the life within us. And that soul, uh, it's almost like the rich fool in this parable. What he forgot was that, that he uh, had that soul and that it was the most important thing in his life and that eventually it would be, in a sense, returned. Do you know that in the scriptures in Genesis 2, 7, and tells us about how God created uh, people. And it says that he formed, do we have Genesis 2, 7, we'll look at it. It says, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. He forms the body. He creates who we are. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The breath of Zoe. This is the life we were created for. God breathes Zoe into uh, the man. And the man became a living being. Or older translations often a living soul. In Greek translation, it's the suke. 
Do you realize there's an intimate connection between God putting his life into us? Our soul is the very essence of who we are. And it has been, we have been created, formed, and then God has breathed his life into us. And so we can use this language sometimes. We talk about my soul. He speaks to his soul. Uh, we sang songs today that talk about, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. It, it, there is something within us that just recognizes there is this core, the very center of who we are in our life. And we are prone as human beings to forget that. We are prone to ignore that which is actually at the very core of who we are, the most important part of who we are, the very essence of who we are. We are prone, and I believe this is part of Jesus' point with the story, we are prone instead to focus on the outer things of life. We're prone to thinking Zoe and life will be found in the abundance of possessions. Be those possessions more crops in the barn. Be those possessions more status or more followers on a social media or more, uh, more you know, savings in your account or more a better house to live in or a postcode. Whatever it is, we are so prone to making the focus of our life achievement, success, a relationship. We are prone to making the focus of our life thinking Zoe will be found out there. And forgetting that actually God created us in such a way that you and I, at our core, there is a soul. Now, the thing about the soul as well, I love what Dallas Willard says, uh, talks about the soul like this. He says it's like a, a river. He says the soul is like an inner stream which refreshes, nourishes, and gives strength to every other element of our life. When we speak of the human soul, we are speaking of the deepest level of life and power in the human being. This is what is at the very center. And we're going to use this picture of a stream that our soul, it's, it's like an inner stream. But we are prone to ignoring the care of that stream. We're prone to forgetting that at our heart that we have been created with a soul and we are prone to focusing on the exterior world. You see, Jesus, when he talks about and answers the, what is the framing question of this whole series. Uh, how can we have Zoe? And he says we find it in loving God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and loving with all our strength. In other words, Jesus is saying with the totality of who you are, we are to love God. It's a snapshot, a picture of all that it means to be human. And all of these pieces, make no mistake, cannot be just sort of neatly uh, divided up too much. But nevertheless, they are different words that bring out different dimensions of what it is to be a person. And we love God with all our heart, as we saw last week. It's like our control center. It's the will. It's where we can make the decision and say, God, I want to love you more than anything else. And we love God with all our soul. It's like realizing that the very essence of who we are, this is the place we connect with God. This is where God has actually breathed our soul into us. And the soul is intimately connected to our heart, to our mind, and to our strength. The condition of our soul will affect our thought life. It will affect our decisions. It will affect our physical reality. The soul is the deepest part of who we are. But the soul is, as we said, it's not always easy to talk about or to figure out, well, then how do we exactly love? But I can tell you this, we love God with all our soul by first beginning to acknowledge the soul is what is most important in our life. You know, in the rich person, he said, soul, you're going to take life easy. You're going to relax. Another word there is you're going to be at rest. You can just be at rest. Why? Because we got all this stuff. We got plenty stored up. And he uses this phrase, eat, drink, and be merry, but he forgets what is the last part of that saying, typically. It's a saying. It actually appears in a lot in antiquity. It's in uh, the Hebrew scriptures. But the whole saying is eat, drink, and be merry for... Tomorrow we die. Typically, it finishes with, for tomorrow we die. It's almost like he's forgotten that there is more to life than just this moment. And so, one of the ways we love God with all our souls, acknowledging we have a soul, it is the most important part of who we are, it, and, and it is on loan to us from God, 
And at some point in life, all the outer stuff, all the accumulation and abundance or whatever doesn't even feel like abundance, but all the possessions, all the exterior, at some point, as the saying goes, will go back into the box. And we care for our soul well when we realize the soul, this is at the core of who God has created us to be. Do you know, Jesus, when he explains this parable, the next thing he begins to talk about, and Jesus typically gives a little explanation of the parable. And so then he gives this explanation. So he says to his disciples, you know, this was to the crowd, the first part, to his disciples and those who want to learn in Luke 12, 22, he says this. He says, therefore, in light of this, in light of what I just told you, in light of this parable about the rich fool who forgot he had a soul and also was a bit confused about what his soul actually needed, the, the rich fool thought that stuff would be what his soul needed. Uh, he says, in light of all that, he says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. Let me say, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious, do not be anxious about your life, about what you will eat or about your body, what you're going to put on. For life is more than food. The body's more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouses nor barn. They don't need to store all this stuff up. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value, let me say value, of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? So if you're not able to do a small thing as that, if you can't do something as simple as adding an hour to your life, I love Jesus. He is the best. If you, don't, if you miss his humor, uh, you're missing a good part of what he's saying. If you can't do a little thing like add an hour to your life, well, then why would you be anxious about the rest? In other words, what is Jesus trying to explain? He's going, listen, if you want to be my disciples, here's how a lot of the world lives. Anxious and worried about all the stuff of life. And so he talks about uh, food, clothes, and in a moment later, he talks about shelter, a house. These are the primary concerns of life, always have been, always will be. And Jesus says uh, the, the human tendency is just to be worried and anxious. Aren't you so glad we don't live in a worried and anxious age? Aren't you so glad that the condition, because our houses and barns and our lives and our clothes and everything is so much, we've got so much more than they did. So thankfully, as we accumulated all these houses and barns and indoors and electricity and indoor plumbing and, and, and all these things, I'm so glad that finally humans now were so at peace. <laughs> what a great thing. You know, maybe now we can get on to adding an hour to our lives, you know, just, oh, isn't it bizarre? Like, it, this stuff, it does not do it. Do you know they uh, looked at the happiness of successive generations across the 20th century? And this would probably be true. Uh, the research I saw was more around the 20th century. Or, you know, we're 20 years into this next one. I don't think it's changed much. But by generation, if you measure the, the perceived experienced happiness generationally, uh, the Oldest generations, go back to the greatest generations, those who were born in the early part of the 20th century, who lived through things like the Depression and two world wars and all these things. And then you've got the later 20th century where, uh, you know, prosperity and material prosperity has gone through the roof. Every generation successively, two things happen. They get less happy and more stuff. And, and it's just, and you could look, and you go, in the 22nd, and, and now, guaranteed that is going. Look at young people. There is an, uh, two epidemics. One of uh, young people have got so much stuff, and I don't say, I could be, I'm a young people too, okay? This is not like a, a, a pointing at anyone. But like, you know, and I've got kids, and, and, you know, my kids have stuff that I would have loved to have had when I was a kid. Like, kids just have more stuff. It's all more accessible, to all the stuff. Uh, and so generally as a rule, the younger they are, they like more stuff than previous generations, but there's also just looking kind of as a blanket comment across the Western world, young people have never been more depressed, lonely, isolated. We have epidemics of things like self-harming and, and terrible thinking. Why? Because we have increased all the physical prosperity and forgotten we are souls. We have forgotten that we have value. We don't, we, we teach, and, and it just, and, and I'm not saying this within the church, I'm just going the culture, the world we live in says over and over again, you are just a body, you are just, an, you're no different than the birds or the other animals, you're no different than, than you're just a, a creature and your life is just physical, your life is just bios. And we've lost sight that the most important part of the reality is you have and are a soul. 
God has breathed his breath into you. And so you have what Jesus says. You have infinitely more value. And God loves the birds and the flowers, and he cares for them and provides for them. And Jesus says, so you, my followers, do you not understand how extraordinarily much God loves you? And that all that stuff you're worried about, and all the exteriors of life, it is not where Zoe is found. The only place you'll find Zoe is in your soul. But if we tell people long enough, you don't even have a soul, or we ignore the soul long enough, or we forget we have a soul, or we don't care for that soul, we will never experience the love of God the way he imagines. And we will just be a further worried and anxious age and if you are here and you're a follower of Jesus, if we do not grab hold of the most important reality is my soul, I can leave the other stuff. Jesus says, just leave the other stuff to God. He'll take care of it. Yes, you need it. We all need food, clothes, shelter. God's not, Jesus doesn't say those things don't matter. No, they do, but you can entrust those to God. What's your job, Dean? What's your job, follower of Jesus? Love God with all your soul. And only then... Only as you learn to love God and receive his love will you find the one thing your soul most wants. And that is zoe. That is rest for your soul. Do you know that your soul wants to be at rest? Your soul wants to be at rest, but so often our souls we have not paid even enough attention to realize that they are worried and anxious about so many things. And always at the core of why we feel so worried and anxious, at the core will always be the question Jesus spoke to. Am I valued by God? Can I trust God with my life? You see, here's my encouragement to you today that there is only one place you will find actual rest for your soul. And Jesus in Matthew 11, he put it in these famous words. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, you're worried and you're anxious about so many things, be they those physical questions of life, be they uh, different challenges you're experiencing, be they uh, someone's standard you're trying to live up to. When Jesus spoke these words, he was talking to Pharisees. They were trying to live up to this religious standard, and I better do this, I better do that. And Jesus says, no, whatever burden you're carrying, come to me, he says, all you who are weary and burdened, and you and I will give you rest. Rest only comes, Zoe only comes from one place. Jesus gives it to us. The God who created us breathes Zoe into our life. And sin has wrecked it all and broken it and fractured it. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have Zoe, have life, have it to the full. I've come that you may have rest, he says, for your soul. And he says, here's how you find it. Take my yoke upon you. Let me hear you say, take my yoke. Turn to the person next to you and say, I want to take that yoke. Some of you did not believe that or enthusiastic about it. But it's the greatest thing you can do. Jesus says, you want to find rest? It will not be found in all this exterior pursuits. Those are good. God knows you need them. He'll take care of those. But come to me and take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let me say learn from me. Jesus wants to teach you how to love God with all your soul. He wants to teach you how to live a life where you find rest for your soul. He says, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. From the weariness, from the anxiousness, from the worry, from all of it, you will find it, and you will find it only as you yoke yourself to Jesus, for his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. Can I tell you the place and the starting point for loving God with all your soul always begins in this place of surrender to Jesus. It begins by saying, Lord, I understand that the Zoe I'm looking for, I understand that the restlessness within my heart and soul, I, I understand that the restlessness within, there's only one place I will find rest and zoe, and abundance in the deepest part of who I am, and that is as I am connected to you. 
When Jesus said, take that yoke, you know, this wasn't a new saying. This is what Rabbi said. What Jesus, and it's to take a yoke, man, I'm going to live under your teaching. I'm going to live under your authority. I'm going to be your disciple. And so Jesus says, you got to take my yoke. And, and you're gonna, I'm going to strap this thing over me and strap it over you. And we're going to learn to walk together. And it's not, you're not going to find Zoe by learning like some things in a book or just by learning some facts or, or memorizing a few things or, or even a couple Greek words that Dean could teach you. No, no. The thing you've got to learn is how to walk through life with me, yeah. together, connected. And Jesus ultimately says, and I'm going to go back to the Father. I'm going to send your spirit. I'm going to be present to you. We find rest for our souls as we pursue the presence of God in our lives, as we put his teachings into practice, as we love him and realize that what my soul needs more than anything else is to be yoked to Jesus. What my soul needs more than anything else is to be a a place where I connect with God. Now, there is so much that we could speak about when it comes to having a healthy soul, caring for our soul, uh, what it looks like to pursue Jesus' presence. There's so much. This is, you know, so my goal today is not that you walk out and go, now I know how to do it. But my one heartbeat for you today is that you might uh, take hold of this reality. You're, you have a soul. It is the place where you're, you are created to connect with your creator. It is the place where he longs to pour out the knowledge of his love into your life. But your soul, just like your body needs taken care of, your soul needs taken care of. Just like it's possible to go through life so busy you don't take note of uh, your physical well-being and how you're going, it is even more possible to go through life and never stop to take note of your soul's well-being. And I want to give you, if you're uh, journeying with us through this, we're sending an email each week, the Heart, Soul, Strength uh, mind email, and it's just to give you ideas on practices because if we don't get yoked to Jesus, if we don't make it a real reality on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, we will never experience the life. Because he doesn't say, put on my yoke for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. He says, walk with me all day long, every day, every season. That's what Jesus calls us to. And so I encourage you, if you want a little bit more practical help, sign up for that email. You can do it from the QR code. And just find some things so that during the week you begin to put it into practice. But here's what I want us to start with today. As we prepare to come to the table to take communion together, to meet with Jesus, I want us to create space for two things. One, uh, it's one of the core habits that we talk about uh, and, and are talking coming out of this. If you want to begin to have a sense of how your soul is, the first step is, is what has been one of the most important habits, disciplines of people who follow Jesus throughout the centuries, and that is to be able to create silence in your life. So many spiritual writers will talk about our soul, it doesn't often shout at us, at least not until it's too late. At some point you realize, my soul's shouting here. But if you want to hear how your soul's doing, you actually have to, we go through life and we go, I'm busy, I'm so busy, I can't even tell you about my week because it was so busy. If we live like this, how will we ever even have a sense of what's going on in our soul? Because our soul is the deepest part of us. It's beneath our thoughts. It's beneath our feelings. It's the core of who we are. And so what we'll do today is we're going to take a moment for one of the best soul practices, and that's to create a little bit of silence. To actually notice, you know, one of the best things you can do in silence is to begin to pay attention to your breathing. I don't think it's any kind of accident that we're told God breathed the breath of life into us and we became a living soul and sometimes when you start to pay attention to your breathing you start to notice things or pay attention to your body because your soul's connected to every part of you you start to realize maybe how am I going not just how you doing how you going no what's going on in my soul what's my soul coveting reaching toward? What's my soul thinking? And if only I had that, then I'd feel at rest. Allowing the Spirit to lovingly, gently search and show us what our souls are loving so that we can take out what needs taken out, offer back what needs offered back. 
and begin to reconnect with the most important thing that we can do, which is to be reminded that we are loved by our Heavenly Father. The answer to worry, the answer to anxiousness at the end of the day is to know deep in the depths of your core that nothing and neither height nor depth nor angels nor demons nor the past nor the present nor the future, neither nothing in all creation, not life, not death, that nothing in all of that can separate us from what? From the love of God in Christ Jesus. So when we know that, that is when our soul is at home. It's when we're reconnected with the love of our Creator. It's when we find peace and rest for our soul, regardless of what's happening in our exterior world, be it seasons that are mountaintops or valleys, it is in that place of knowing we are so deeply loved. This is what God wants to pour into your soul. And sometimes he has to say to us, do you know what? You're filling your soul with this. Now I can't pour my love there. Sometimes he has to say to us, do you know, you, you're, you're longing after this. And, and he has to, of course, calibrate and correct us. But God wants to meet with us at the level of our soul. He wants to love us the level of our soul and it's out of response to that that we are freed up to love God with all our soul so I want to invite you to stay seated where you are but get yourself comfortable for a moment and we are going to take a moment and just be silent and just take note of your interior life this may feel a bit awkward for some of you for others of you, it's a regular practice and habit. We're going to take just about the next two minutes. For some of you, again, if you're just starting with it, that'll feel like eternity. For others, you'll say, Dean, I wish we could have just had 30 minutes of silence instead of you talking. But, but before we meet with Jesus, I want to give you just a couple of moments and, and just to still the inside. Take some deep breaths. It's good to just take deep breaths in and out and start to quiet yourself. Create a place of stillness. Notice how's your soul 